She's a visiting professor of journalism at Kingston University. She's a winner of Celebrity Mastermind and Stonewall Broadcaster of the Year Award, broadcaster, journalist, and writer. Please welcome to the stage, Samira Ahmed. <laughs> and we'll explain why in a minute. Because um, you're pretty into Wonder Woman, aren't you? Yeah, actually, if I thought about it, I'd be wearing one of my flare trouser suits from the 70s, inspired by Wonder Woman. But uh, I was hoping we'll you were that. Going to start doing this, you know. But no, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> so tell us about your love for Wonder Woman. And you're like you're into the comics and DC comics from the 60s and 70s and. Uh, Lisa, once you, once you get old enough, your entire childhood becomes kind of curated and, and people are fascinated because, um, you know, they wonder what did you do in the old days. So I went to America in 76 as a child. I was lucky to have parents who took me on fancy holidays. And I just started reading comics then. And this was, you know, real... Um, a real feminist time in comics. So Diana Prince was, I think she was a reporter at the UN. She was Ms. Diana Prince. That's when I knew I would always be Ms. And also when I knew that I would, trouser suits were important and empowering. Um, and <laughs> she's remained a really serious role model ever since. Fantastic. Yeah. There was also a thing about she had a man in uniform, but yeah. I never quite managed that. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? I never managed that, sadly. <laughs> Shame, I suppose there's always time. Yeah. Possibly. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, talking of trouser suits, you look very good at Celebrity Mastermind. I thought you went for the sort of Doctor Who look. Oh, don't say that. Trade in the seventies T-shirt, but with the trouser suit. I had, I have a seventies NASA T-shirt, uh, which is my lucky T-shirt that I bought at Huntsville, um, at the big kind of um, rocket. Um, museum they have there in Alabama and yeah, and I just wore it with a suit and I thought I knew that you have to walk from the black chair and it's and you're nervous anyway so I thought I'd wear sensible shoes so hence the trainers and I was on with a Dr Pixie McKenna who nearly fell over in her Vivian Westwood heels um, and also lost very badly so I felt that anything that eliminated the nerves no, no it's credit to her I mean she did really well considering um, but she was very nervous it was the heels what did it wasn't it she she lost because of the heels. Well, do you know what I realise is I spend most of my time sitting sort of in a studio with lights glaring at me, talking out on camera. So the idea of being in a chair with the spotlight and talking to someone wasn't nerve-wracking. I think actually a lot of people get unnerved by it. Like, that's so interesting because I think everyone imagines it to be pretty scary, doesn't it? It is a bit, but if I've, if you, I mean, I'm the kind, I was real swat at school, so I really prepared for that so hard, <laughs> so hard. And I only go in for things to win, which is why, you know, I'm you a bit sad. Win yeah. Did you win it? Yes, you yeah. did. Yeah, and even better, I beat Giles Corrin by one point, and he's still really, really pissed off about it. <laughs> He's absolutely lovely to me, but he's really upset. He can specify the questions that he thinks should have been different. But didn't he put stuff out like on Twitter saying, I haven't really done much swatting up, and you just thought that was a lie? Yeah, well, he and Robert Webb, were, well, we're all, they would record it all in one go, and you get loads and loads of people kind of sort of brought in in little kind of rounds. And they were talking on Twitter about, I've done no work, and they'd both written columns, I think, about how they'd done no work. This is such boy tactic. So I just went on Twitter and I said, well, actually, I have laminated my notes after highlighting them, <laughs> which was my girl tactic. Um, and, and I was, I, afterwards, as we were coming out, they were lining up the next lot to go in, and I came up clutching my trophy, um, and I saw Robert Webb going in, and I went, should have laminated your notes. <laughs> I don't know if you won. Good for you. And so you've got your little mastermind. She was really sad. I, I never won. I was really bad at sports. So I won no trophies or anything. And I have two trophies now on my piano. And one is Celebrity Mastermind, <laughs> which is so cool. And, and it's really heavy and made of glass. I mean, it's outrageous. Yeah. And, and the other one is my Stonewall one. And I'm just so proud of that one. So, you know, those are my only awards, really. Oh, and my News Round News Hand badge that I got when I was 10. <laughs> I've lost it, actually, you're right, but I did win it. I did win it. She won it, she won it. That was 1978. Budding journalist, or what, wrote to John Craven's news round. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, they, they had a show called News Round Weekly in the summer. Did, is anyone old enough to remember okay. news? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
and, and Lucy... Remember, hang on, who doesn't remember Newsround? Yeah. Come on, let's know. A few of you. You know Dawn Craven, though, don't you? Because he's in... Well, we were talking earlier how all these people like John Craven, all the men, they're all still working, aren't they? And where are all the women? But uh, we can have that conversation later, too. Um, but, yeah, we, we were encouraged to write in letters about your news stories um, on the summer edition, which is called Newsround Weekly. And it's an amazing set of coincidences that I turned on that day and saw my letter being read out. But it was actually quite you know, a sad story because it was about being chased by a, a gang of racist children um, in a playground. And it was the first time I'd really experienced that, when you, know, you start being taunted and then you're being threatened with violence and I made the decision that we're going to run for it. And then we were chased down the street by this gang of children. And yeah, I wrote this letter sort of being a bit angry and saying, why can't there be park wardens? I mean, you know, not like that's a solution. But what was very interesting was that Lucy Marthen, who incidentally was the first Asian female reporter at the BBC, um, you know, she was on, and I was very interested to see what she would say. And John said, has anything like this ever happened to you? And it's the first time anyone had ever referred to her race, in a way, on, in the programme. And she said, you know, I think if anyone's a bit different, something can happen, and it's very important that you report things to an adult. And out of the blue, three years ago, so we're talking about, you know, more than 30 years later, I got an email from her to say, was it you who sent in that letter, Samira? Because I've been haunted by it ever since. I felt I gave a completely inadequate response. And part of it was, as the only Asian woman on BBC News, I didn't want to make a thing about racism, but my God, what she went through. So we met up, and um, I subsequently interviewed her for a Ready Full programme. But, you know, what she faced being a very young, she's like in early 20s, you know, Asian woman reporter at the BBC, and all those attitudes that existed, and all the sexism that was there anyway I thought was really it was it just felt so wonderful that we finally got together as two journalists who'd done different things and she famously quit journalism at 36 um, and retrained as a medical doctor at 36 because she felt as a journalist she couldn't change things and she felt ashamed and she felt um, being a doctor she could actually improve people's lives so it's a really interesting choice she made it really is and as a journalist can you change things do you think well I, t I think about it a lot, and I, I don't kid myself that journalists um, necessarily change things immediately. But I, I mean, gone on to debate news values with Alan de Baton recently. Um, I'm just so annoyed by that kind of attitude, which is, oh, news is just really depressing and it makes us all fearful. And you think news challenges all the things that are wrong because we know that they're wrong and we want to make things better. So some of that is about exposing bad sentencing when you find a serial sex offender who's never got a proper jail term, but he cuts a schoolgirl into pieces, and then suddenly he's given a whole life tariff which is the, the toughest story I've ever done and that story made me angry and I, um, it's the murder of Rochelle Holness and I'd like to think that reporting like that over time starts to make people think about sentencing and affects you know whether they report bad behavior you know because it starts it all starts somewhere so I think journalists can we're part of I mean it's the big story I always tell students is my first journalistic experience was when I was um, I'm trying to think I was about 19 and I was on work experience at my local newspaper, and the very first story I was sent on with a reporter was to go to the house of a chap whose son had died in a car accident. And they were expecting us. We didn't just go knock at the door. And he welcomed us with a big smile, and we went in, and he'd taken a photograph off the mantelpiece, and that was the one we were going to use. And we, and we did an interview about, you know, what was his son's university plans. Now, Every year, I don't know how many young people pass their driving test and die in a car accident, but, you know, it is a few. And actually celebrating each life and marking it in the news is part of actually civil society. It shows that all life matters. And I think we often forget that side of journalism, which is about recording people who've lived and what they've done in their own lives and celebrating that. Absolutely. Just going back for a minute to your childhood again, your mum, Lolita, worked for the BBC World Service, so you were kind of surrounded by the notion of broadcasting, and she is, in fact, an actress. Yes, well, this is the, the great connection with um, Alison, which is my mother was in um, Brick Lane and in, and in Eastern Promises in really tiny roles, but she's the evil money lender in, in Brick Lane. Great job in it, yeah. um, she's so scary. And the thing is, you know, she often plays really scary mothers and it's I know that look. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> Although she doesn't have those warts. They're not real warts. She's uh, not the frightened you. <laughs> she, she still does. <laughs> but she's lovely. Um, the weird thing is, I didn't think of her as being a a journalist because she wasn't she was an actress yeah. and but just being in bush house with her which is the where the world service was i was surrounded by all these people from all over the world and there was that wonderful sense that the world service did about um 
well, a lot of these people are political dissidents and exiles, and they're reporting factually. And, and I think that's the most important thing about the BBC and about what British journalism at its best represents, which is tell the facts, be impartial, and speak to the whole world. So I used to sit in on all these conversations, you know, wandering around broadcasting ha a Bush House with people discussing politics in India or Nepal or, you know, in Eastern Europe. And it was the 70s when, you know, the Cold War, and for those who are too young to remember it, I can't tell you how you know, frightening a time it was. And it was so important to feel that there were all these challenges to that system going on from this one building in London. It was Fantastic. fabulous. Lucky you. What a, what a wonderful, rich... Oh, and just all the stuff like reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, which oh. they were still using when I started, which you would cut with a, a razor blade and splice yeah. together like film. And I still miss that. Yeah, fun. Very exciting. I remember going on a trip to Devon Air in, in Torquay and seeing all that going on. Very exciting. Yeah. And you went to Oxford and read English, but you also were very heavily involved in sort of student journalism even then, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm one of those people who just knew very young that's what I wanted to do. And... So I used to make my newspapers out of bits of paper as a child, and I used to make my own radio shows. I used to record on little tape recorders. And so when I went up, I edited the student, um, the main student magazine called Isis at the time. And I also edited Union, which was the Oxford Union's magazine. And weirdly, the, the president of the unit at the time was Michael Gove. So I've still got my copy where he wrote this letter in the front, his like message to the, and it was all about how you have to challenge elitism and Oxford shouldn't be finishing schools for the, the rich. And, and I mean, the one thing I'll say about him, because I honestly sincerely believe it, he, he really sincerely does believe, I think, in trying to improve outcomes. I think there's a huge dispute about his approach, um, but I don't doubt his sincerity. And that speech, I mean, he could deliver that speech today, and he wrote it when he was 19. And the funniest thing about Michael Gove is that I always felt at the time he was like a 40-year-old trapped in a 19-year-old's body, and now he's the right age. <laughs> But he's still sort of 19 years old. Um, I don't know. But the other thing that was funny was I edited Union um, with Toby Litt. I don't know if you know Toby Litt, the novelist. And Toby was very arty, and I, I was quite in awe of this artistic person and who had uh, black polar necks and listened to Leonard Cohen and all those things that were, were new to me. And I think the two of us found it quite interesting sitting in a room with these people who were all all clearly going to be future politicians. Wow. You know, already then, I mean, Boris Johnson was president of the union when I first went up. And I remember, I didn't know who he was, but everyone said, oh, he's going to be something in politics. And Jacob Rees-Mogg, everyone, he was a laughing stock. People thought, who will this idiot ever be? He desperately wants to be a Tory MP. How funny is that? You know, um, took him a few attempts, but they're all, they're all doing what they wanted. But there you were doing what you wanted. You won a journalism prize. Yes, I did the Philip Geddes Prize, which was awarded um, at my college, um, which is quite nice. Quite nice, and did in fact become the Channel 4 newsreader, etc., etc. And so the story goes. Oh, don't on. call me a newsreader, I never like that oh, word. Okay. What I, do you prefer? Presenter. Journalist. 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 Yeah, okay. yeah and, and you know, one of the reasons I left Channel 4 News was um, by the end I wasn't being allowed to do the reporting or the main presenting, and I just thought I don't want to read news like a handmaiden so uh, you know and I, I do much more interesting work now but I mean the stuff that I'm really proud of there was all the stuff that I was out reporting or doing interviews but no one I, no one should go into journalism to sit and read autocue no absolutely so what are you proudest of at channel 4 uh, the film I made um, on correct so-called corrective rape in South Africa which is what won the Stonewall award and this was in 2009 and, and how it came about is quite interesting um, the charity Action Aid. They're, they're a really interesting organisation because they don't just go in from Britain and they lecture people about how to live. They work very much with local partners. And they came to me and they said, there's this amazing thing we've discovered that in South Africa, which already has a very high rate of sexual violence, um, lesbian women are being targeted for so-called corrective rape and often being murdered. And we thought this might make a big story for International Women's Day. And I said, sod International Women's Day, it's a news story. And I really worry about this idea that you just dump all your stories about FGM and all those things into International Women's Day so that male news editors don't have to deal with them the rest of the year. And I said, let's just do it as a story. And, you know, the, the foreign editor at Channel 4 News, Ben De Pehino, edits it. He's a brilliant editor. He commissioned it straight away. And I went out and I met these amazing families. Um, and the reason, again, it goes back to one of your earlier questions. No one in South Africa was reporting this story. I was outside the courthouse reporting on a rape case and there's all these delays in the system. You know, it's, it's, it's really part of the problem is even if you find a prosecution and get it going, they lose the papers, people don't turn up in court, it goes on and on for years. And I met this reporter from one of the national networks and she said, I can't get this story on the bulletins because there's already so much violence and murder in South Africa. And quite frankly, 
black women being murdered in a township, you know, in terms of pecking order. It wasn't getting attention. Now, my piece aired a week later, and it was in the run-up to the World Cup. And the, the main story I was telling this wonderful woman, Yudi Simulani, who was a former national football player, who was training to be the first female referee in the World Cup. She was this woman who's, who'd been murdered this way. And the day after the story ran on Channel 4 News, the South African High Commission rang me up and asked for a transcript. Now, I'm not saying anything could change overnight about it. In fact, the piece very much didn't pretend to offer solutions. But by shining a spotlight on something, at least we're forcing people to confront something that's going on. And that's the start of change. Incredibly moving yeah. interviews you had with those women as well. Well, there was the mother, and I, I'm always amazed at the power of people who've lost someone in the family, yeah. um, talking about having to go and identify her, her daughter's body. But also I was fascinated by the men because Yudi's brother had taught her how to play football, and he was the one who took me to the place where her body was found in a ditch, and just to be able to stand and do that. Um, but also her father had been an anti-apartheid campaign who'd been imprisoned, and this was the new South Africa that they had campaigned for, which has one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, guarantees the rights of, you know, all peoples, you know, lesbian, gay, transgendered, everything. And the gap between the idealism of the constitution and the state they hope for and people's social attitudes is still so great. But I liked the fact that we dealt with that honestly, that this is one of the challenges of South Africa. Mm. You know. And then she won the award. Well, what I was proud of was the fact that no one submitted... I mean, I didn't submit my work for an award. Stonewall do their own... They find stories and they drop their own shortlist. And someone told me, your work has been nominated. So that, that meant all the more to me, that people had noticed it and proud felt... Moment. Yeah, I mean, I'm proud, I'm proud for all the people who, you know, who were willing to speak to me. Um, and, you know, I'm still in touch with some of them. And, you know, when that trial happened, Yudi's killers were brought to trial. Sadly, I think only two people were convicted of anything out of a gang of five. But CNN, the BBC, everybody around the world was covering that story and there is more attention on it. Mm. So that's where you do make a difference. Well, you try. I'm not kidding myself that, you know, mm. I, was, I was making the difference myself. But I'm glad I did the story and I'm glad I fought for it just to be a new story and not put it in a box that says women's issues because I think there is still a huge tendency in British newsrooms. I honestly feel it that, you know, oh, we can't have two stories about women being murdered or mutilated in the bulletin. It's just too depressing. Male news editors say this, mm. you know, but they don't think twice about having three stories about Westminster in the same bulletin. No. <laughs> Tell us about Islam Unveiled, which is another hard-hitting, wonderful documentary that you did for Channel 4. Well, this is, um, I mean, some time ago, um, it was aired in 2004. It was a two-part documentary series, and it was kind of essentially looking at, can you be a feminist and a Muslim? So I was genuinely interested. Channel 4 were commissioning it, and they approached me, <laughs> as I was already working at Channel 4 News, to present it. So I didn't pitch the idea, and I've always been a bit ambivalent about as you always are whenever you come from any kind of minority background about do I really want to be doing Muslim things and but it, I thought it was it was an opportunity to investigate things they didn't know and I got to go to places like Iran which were fascinating um, it was it was made about a year after 9-11 so very much in the, still the aftermath of the horror of what had happened and the starting point was you know Mohammed Atta um, one of the lead hijackers had said he wanted no, he'd left a will and said I want no women at my funeral no women at my grave and so the idea of the misogyny went right to the heart of what what these kinds of um, you know nutcases um, believe. So we went to um, I mean I didn't in the end go to Nigeria. It's the only country I couldn't um, travel to. But we went to Malaysia, which has a whole states which are run by Muslim governments where women have to wear the veil if they're Muslim. So the only women who don't are ethnic Chinese. Then they've closed down all the bars and hotels. So the whole tourist trade there is just shut down in you know parts of Malaysia. Um, and then you know Iran, which was like East Germany for having this whole set of states beliefs, but an incredibly feminist country in many ways, um, where women are doing all the same jobs as men, and it's got the highest divorce rate in the world, <laughs> instigated by women, incidentally, uh, which is, uh, that could have been an old documentary. So um, it was quite an interesting opportunity to look at how different countries live. We were in Pakistan, which has deteriorated so much as a, as a, as a civil society, um, and the influence of the Taliban has just stunned me. I mean, I have, I have heritage that my father's family um, are mostly there, and looking back 10 years to when that documentary aired, it's depressing to think how much worse things have got. And there are all these amazing feminist Muslims out there trying to challenge it, but I, I genuinely wonder if the scales have tipped too far the other way in a lot of these countries now. Mm. I love the way you kept revisiting the Quran itself, 
and sort of showing, demonstrating misrepresentation? Of yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I, I try now very hard to keep away from interpreting religious texts because it's so contentious and there are different interpretations. But I still stand by the fact that there are, I think it's seven references to the hijab in the Quran and not one of them is meant as a physical veil. They're all metaphors. And I think that's really interesting. And then the reference to dressing talks about covering your beauty and no specific reference to veiling. So, you know, I think it's really interesting how much of that kind of hardcore belief that has becoming in increasingly mainstream in Britain over my lifetime, I've seen attitudes become much more hardline. Um, it's depressing to, to see that people are going for different sources to justify it. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you liked it. I, I don't know. I I, I, it, was, it was tricky. We had an all-female crew, which helped us get access to interesting places. And also, it, it's quite interesting the attitudes you get from men mm. when you're operating as an all-female crew. Some, some of them were shocking, weren't they, what they said? Oh, well, there, there was the... It, yeah, you reminded me. There's the Egyptian cleric who was explaining why... Um, female genital mutilation is actually beneficial to the woman. And he was demonstrating, because he was talking in Arabic, we had a translator, and he was going like this to demonstrate cutting off the clitoris um, and about how, yeah, um, women are uncomfortable with it. And it's much more comfortable for them if they don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. And you just, because he's not speaking English, you just think, I, I, know, I don't quite know what he's saying, but I think I, know. I, I was watching your yeah, face. Different reactions. I know that they're not cut at the same time, but it, it just... I know, <laughs> it was just... They, cho they were chosen well. I suppose when you think back, it helps when you're talking to someone saying the most appalling things, they're saying it in a foreign language, so you can't react instantly. Yes. Um, because what's yeah. the point of getting angry with them and, you know, getting them to say it on tape? But what was interesting is that you told me that they were aired at the most ridiculous oh, time. Yeah, no, I have all kinds of issues about the airing. So this was commissioned and filmed, then sat on a shelf for nine months not being aired, and then a new head of Channel 4 came in, uh, Kevin Ligo and he decided to run it and it got scheduled part one ran at um, trying to remember 11.25 p.m. on a Saturday night great Saturday night view part two was the following the next day Sunday night uh, 1.25 a.m. so Monday morning and you know this was this was the days before you know 4OD and everything so if you're interested in watching it is on Samira's website which is similar. yeah I, I mean hard cash haven't noticed and taken it down so I've just put the links up but you can watch both parts but the best thing was that um, I could see what it had been scheduled after and it was scheduled after the network premiere of dude where's my car and I and my husband said you know what you should have called your documentary dude where's my clitoris <laughs> and then that would have kept people stable. it would have been a channel 4 documentary kind of title wouldn't it, it would, rather than Islam unveiled. tell us about the fun bits because it seems to me what's lovely is that researching you that you know you, there's the hardcore really serious stuff and there's a lot of fun in there as well you know the wonder woman kind of fun but tell us about the fun bits of i don't know at channel four or the bbc um i think what i always what, what was great about channel four and is great about the bbc is because of the organisation you work for, people are often willing to say yes. So you can take an idea and the chances that it will work out. And I mean, a recent example where actually they came to me is um, of the film director John Waters was speaking at um, the um, um, Homotopia Festival in Liverpool. And uh, the woman who does the press for that used to be the press officer at Channel 4 News. She's a mate of mine. So she said, look, he's going to do one, one or two interviews. Would you like one of them? And I went, yeah, that would be great. And I managed to get a whole program with him. But brilliant, I got it on Radio 3, um, where, where, you know, it's a bit more highbrow. Um, but also I had 45 minutes. So we did a whole, you know, hours of chat. We edited it down to 45 minutes. And I was saying to you before that, you know, I like to prepare really well for interviews. So I had to go and get all the films. And I'd see my kids off to school. I always felt there was something quite sort of um, artistically appropriate about tying it up. I felt like divine. My kids would go off to school. And then I'd sit down and watch Pink Flamingos and feel very decadent or be doing the ironing or watching female trouble and and I mean he was just charming and interesting anyway um so part of the fun is when you do show bits because I don't do it as a full-time job I do news so when you do someone who's kind of got an entertainment factor you're doing them because they've got a news value and you know we look, talked about censorship I mean I, I got a news story out of it he said you know he thinks actually these days a lot of heterosexual porn is obscene now this is a man whose whole you know sort of purpose in life is to cause offence and and you know he thinks that there are issues now with porn so I thought you know you get you get interesting views when you try and put news questions to people who might otherwise just be asked to tell us about your new film talking of people who went out and out to cause offence David Bowie um, he did a great documentary, radio documentary about him. 
yeah, I really enjoyed that. I don't know, did any of you hear I Dressed Ziggy Stardust? I dressed Ziggy Stardust. It was on Radio 4 last, about a year ago, actually, it was April last year. And it was, it's interesting how it came about. I, I had two big role models, and one was Lucy Marthen, who was the Newsround reporter I told you about, who I met. And the other was Sharma Pereira, who is a journalist who used to present a show I watched a lot in the 80s called The Six O'Clock Show. And she was one of the first Asian women reporters on Fleet Street. I mean, you know, just an amazing woman. And... I can't remember how we met up, but we just finally met up a couple of years ago. And she's told me about how she used to be a huge David Bowie fan. And she used to hang around outside his house and his flat. And she sent in a sketch for a costume, which was the one-leg, one-armed jumpsuit. And um, what's her name? Angie was particularly lovely to the fans and said to her one day, oh, you know, you know we're having it made up. And he came out one day and he ruffled her hair and he said, are you coming to the show on Saturday? You're going to get such a surprise. And that was where she saw her costume. And I said, have you not made a documentary or, or anything? She said, I've written a little blog post about it, which she sent me. And I said, can I pitch this story? Let's make the, the story of I Dress Ziggy Stardust. And you see, I'd been fascinated by David Bowie. I was I'm about eight years younger than Sharma. And not only was I younger, but I'm, I was so incredibly... Not, not just that I had kind of stricter parents, but I was so con sort of conservative with the small C. I would never have dared go and hang around outside a pop star's house. And I was genuinely fascinated and honestly genuinely terrified by David Bowie as a small child. So we had these two parallel stories of growing up in 70s London. And then we found all these other people, like, like Shami Chakrabarti had a huge David Bowie obsession. And I just thought, looking at the 70s in suburbia through a, an Asian perspective, and, if, and it turned out in the end, every voice in that documentary was female. We we got um, Cherry Vanilla, who used to do his PR. We had Susie Ronson, Mick Ronson's partner, who was his costume designer who looked after them. And um, I can't think who else was in it. And it's not that I set out to make it deliberately all female, but it kind of ended up being that way. And when the David Bowie exhibition opened, and they had all these programme events, and Gary Kemp is speaking, and Robert Elms is speaking, and, you know, and I have huge respect for them all. Not one woman was involved in a single one of those events, and yet his female fans were the biggest part of what made him. And people like Angie Bowie have been written about so negatively. Um, and I didn't if you saw, she was interviewed on a documentary cut recently. She's, I mean, yeah, you know, I've tried to think, does anyone remember what it was about? Um, I don't know if it was about a club or it was just about a decade. Um, I know, it was that Channel 4 documentary. It was brilliant. It was about the history of gay clubs and gay music in Britain and how it shaped pop music. And she was interviewed in it. And I just think it's very interesting how many of the women in rock history have just been written out of the stories. And, I was, and the BBC in the end, because they'd commissioned it, and then suddenly it was announced he was releasing a new album. It just fitted. I mean, it was real serendipity, and it became their kind of flagship item for that time. Fantastic. So I'm quite chuffed that that worked out. Yeah. But it was a true story. Yeah, it's great. It's a lovely story. I liked it very much. And of course, old Bowie won the Brit Award last night for Best Male. Yeah, though he didn't turn up. At 67. Didn't turn but up. Did anyone see it? Brit Awards. But we worked out that we wouldn't want him to turn up, would we? Because, you know, he's, he's the... He sort of almost needs to just... He's just the know. myth. I, don't, I, I remember He's saying it. In his absence, yeah, it? and I remember I went on Robert Elm's um, show on BBC London to talk about the documentary, and he said, you know what, would you like to meet him? And I said, you know what, I don't. It's never been about that. It is more about what he represented in our lives um, and what he, you know... The idea that a, a white man would choose to stand out, choose to draw negative attention, what all immigrant kids were desperate to do was to fit in. That was the most wonderful inspiration. Yeah. You know, and I met this Hindu, I don't know if you remember, I met this woman who was, there are not many Hindu female priests, but one of them was inspired directly by David Bowie and Mark Boland, because Mark Boland reminded her of Lord Krishna. I just thought that's so lovely, <laughs> you know. And she'd come from Uganda, and she was living in rural Wales, and she turned on top of the pops, and there was Mark Boland and David Bowie. And she went, um, yes, and there was something, you know, very non uh, androgynous about them, you know, and beautiful, like female. And yet, you could also see that they were very male because their trousers were so tight. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. I want to go back to Celebrity Mastermind because I was most upset when I read that you were going to, in fact, cover Star Trek. Yeah, I wanted to do classic Star Trek, but they said you can't. She's quite a geek, actually. Yeah, well, I don't know, these days that everyone is a geek, so now maybe I shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> but they told you you couldn't do it. They, I couldn't do it because someone had done the Star Trek movies, the series before, but I just think the standard's gone down. Because, you know, there was someone on doing the Back to the Future movies. There are only three. Oh, yeah, come on. You know. Yours, yours was quite hardcore. Laura Ingalls Wilde. Yeah, she wrote seven novels. And, In fact, and there's one that was published posthumously, and I had to read a biography. Famously... 
House Little House on the Prairie, Prairie, which is much better than the TV series. They're amazing books. Tell us, why did, so why did you choose um, I had I, I, I buy a lot of second-hand books, and I'd started reading them just after the economic crash. And she wrote them in the Great Depression because she'd lost, she and her husband lost all their money in the Great Depression. And they were these nostalgic books about her childhood growing up. You know, everything was made, even the nails they made themselves to build their own house. And so she, set, she was the prototype for people like J.K. Rowling, you know, building a, a series of books, and the character grows up with the readers. And they're wonderfully written. In fact, the one I really recommend is The Long Winter, where her family was snowed in for seven months. They, couldn't, they just couldn't go anywhere for seven months, and they survive. And it's, it's almost existential the way that they, they pray to God, but God's really not there. And they somehow survive it, and they, they grind some uh, grains to make one loaf of bread a day, and they keep the cattle alive. And the, the snow doesn't melt till May. I mean, it's just an amazing story. And even though they're all fictionalized, they're quite dark. But the reason I, 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 I then thought I might do it as a topic was I kept talking to my husband about them, and he said, you know, you, you, you should do it. And I discovered that they were all being reread and selling in big numbers after the crash, the, the, the 2008 crash, because people were sort of looking for some kind of comfort, and they were turning back to this idea of the home and... I don't know, um, making your own, I don't know, slaughtering your own pigs and rendering your own lard and all those things that people do Fantastic. when they need comfort. Me, it did make me laugh. You, know, you kind of tapped a lot of your contacts to, to gen up on general knowledge and stuff. Well, my, father, my father-in-law is a chemist. He used to work at ICI. So he came up with, actually, no, he didn't come up with any um, chemistry for me. He came up with a list of major sporting events and venues because um, I'm really lame on sport. But like everyone who'd won the FA Cup going back to the 70s and, um, you know, lots of kind of big cricket things. And then, of course, the question that I stumped was, um, they asked you essentially, what is a wicket? And it was such an obvious answer. I thought it can't be that easy a question, so I gave no answer. But yeah, my sister tested me on the periodic table on the phone on the day of the recording. I was really sad. If I'd lost after that... <laughs> Can you imagine the shame? Yeah, it's all I have. Did any of that actually help you with the questions? Or did you know well, the Pixie McKenna got asked a question, which is, what is the temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit? Or oh, sorry, what is, like, what is zero degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit or something? Um, or the other way around, and she didn't know. And he just thought, oh, I could have had that question. <laughs> No. Very funny. 32. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. So you carried on after Oxford talking about being girly sport. You went on to City University. And yeah, did the, the postgraduate newspaper diploma then. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cross about this now. In those days, you could still become a journalist just from school. And there were lots of jobs in local papers. And there were people like Juliette Bremner at the BBC, now at ITN, who did. She never went to university. And so City University was one of the few postgrad courses. And it was great. Um, but it was... Um, what was it called? It was a diploma. And then a few years ago, they turned it into an MA. Um, and it now costs something like £10,000 to do. I don't know. Maybe it's less. Maybe it's only six or seven. I don't know. But that kind of thing really depresses me because it makes it completely unaffordable for, for so many people. And it just turns journalism into this little upper middle class enclave of people with mums and dads who can afford all those fees. But did it actually help you? Well, it was a useful bridge. I'd rather have just gone straight into a job. But, you know, yeah, it, it helped. Um, and then I got onto the BBC News trainee scheme, which was the big thing that changed my life. Because me as you do, straight out of university. Well, it's a graduate intake scheme. And, you know, I was fortunate to be on it. And, of course, it was... It was salaried, and to their credit, the BBC still runs schemes like that where you are salaried and you're trained in all aspects. So, you know, you you make your own news night on the news night set. You make your own Today programme in the Today programme studio. And wow. it was just fantastic. Did you feel kind of nervous and green? But no, I was... I mean, the, the quality of teaching was great. One of our instructors was Peter Dorling, who was one of the old news announcers from the 1950s and 60s and so you had all these people who were veterans from a slightly different age and it was TV Centre which was so lovely and glamorous and completely untainted by all the associations we now have with Jimmy Savile and all that um, and there was just time you know and and support to do everything and the biggest surprise was I always thought I'd work in newspapers my ambition was always to be a report on the Guardian I had a Scott Trust Guardian bursary at City University and when I got the BBC News trainee scheme Peter Preston the editor said you know come back and talk to us when you've done it and I kept thinking that's where I'm going to go but actually I found I loved TV in particular and I loved that whole thing about being someone with a microphone and getting in the scrum and turning the story around in a, a live way um, which was really exciting. And that buzz has never... I mean, I've been in journalism for 25 years and I still feel as excited, if not more so, than when I first joined. And there's not many jobs you could really say that.
That's true. So talking of live, have you ever had any terrifying yes. moments where things have gone horribly wrong? Yes, yeah. I, yeah oh, well, God. Um, I wrote about it in my diary. I still keep a diary. And I, I talked about it in capital letters as the bad incident, because that's how awful it was. I couldn't even name it. Um, we used to have radio cars, which are these kind of vans, and they would park somewhere near your story on location, and they'd they'd stick a mast up that went up about 50 feet and it had to be in visual sight of either Crystal Palace or the Alexander Palace, Alexandra Palace transmitter in London and there was an IRA bomb attack at Whitehall and I got dispatched, I was a duty reporter, it was 10 at night and I rushed down there and you know when you're running around on foot it's quite a big area and I went with the, um, the van and so I knew where the van was parked and I went off and I got my interviews with the police and everything and I came back with not that much time to write and file copy and the van had moved and I thought <laughs> Oh my God. And I don't think we had mobiles in those days either. Or if we did, it was unreliable. And, and by the time I found the van, um, it was 10 to midnight. And midnight's the big bulletin you're filing for. And there was another reporter there and she was filing for the, the Radio 2 bulletin. And I made the mistake of thinking, well, I'll just ad lib, you know. Um, and of course you can't. And I just got myself to panic. So I just kept fluffing it. And, I'd, and they said, actually, we're going to go with the report that... Um, I'm trying to think who it was. June Kelly has filed. But the thing is, when you file into BBC News, they have a thing called traffic, and it's like a tannoy system, and everyone in the whole of the BBC can hear it. So they can, they can tune across to whoever's filing from where. So, you know, it was a really public um, way to fail. And, you know, I honestly thought, I'm not joking, I honestly thought, God, I'm not going to get my contract renewed. I was on a three-month contract, as sadly too many people still are. It was my first job after being a trainee. And... Um, I assumed I wouldn't get my contract renewed, so I actually went off looking for other work within the BBC, and I got a job as a, as a news anchor at the new BBC World Service TV station. And I then got called in after a few days by my editor, who said, you know, you're going to have to win back a lot of people's trust, but we are going to renew your contract. And I went, oh, because I didn't know you were going to do that, so I've got another job <laughs> in television. Um, and I ended up going back as a news reporter later, but um, it was very, very scary. And I, it wasn't my fault, really, was it? I still Bless don't know. Young no. Samira. Any questions from the audience for Samira? Because she has to zip off at night. It's, I don't know. I sometimes think there's something about these times where jobs are being cut um, that, that's somehow acceptable to be a bit harsher again. And I think that's in a lot of professions. I think journalism was always a bit of a bullying place. And I, you know, if you ever had Dayman Leslie, who was on Fleet Street in the 60s and 70s, tell her story about stubbing out a cigarette on sort of a sexual harasser's hand or something, you kind of think, well, we're not quite back in those days. But I just know, I think there is a problem. Um, but tackling it is really hard. And, or I always say to people, you know, challenge it straight away. Um, and being a member of a union is really important and taking things to the union. And the NUJ has been, the National Union of Journalists has been really important in my career. And it's one of the biggest pieces of advice I give. Oh, I said something to ask me about OJ. I covered the OJ Simpson trial. OJ Simpson, ask about OJ Simpson in LA. <laughs> she was in LA, this woman, in Berlin. And yeah, was I was um, BBC's LA correspondent from 96 to 97. Um, you don't have to ask about it, but I thought I'd well, mention it. Just, <laughs> do you want to give us a quick thingy on it? A quick thingy on it. Um, What's a thingy, Wayne? Right? Carry on. Well, the thing that's interesting about that story, I went out after the original criminal trial, which you may remember he was acquitted, and then the families of his two victims sued um, in the civil courts, and they won. And what people chose to ignore, you know, certainly here, there was a bit of snootiness about it, was it's like David Beckham being charged with the murder of his ex-wife. Okay, that's... That's how big a figure he was. But also, it was a story about domestic violence. This man had this appalling record of how he used to beat her up. And when that case came, I looked for the details. You cover it as a straight criminal case. The celebrity masked the fact there's a real crime story there. And I, one of the things, when they announced the compensation, because it was all money, that, that was the damages, I remember it was like a couple of hundred dollars for the clothes that were all slashed and bloodied. And it's little details like that that remind you that a real crime took place. And too many of the journalists, they were going for barbecues at his house during the trial and then turning up on CNN and commentating on it. I mean, I found that appalling. Um, but, but, you know, you saw justice done. And um, there's a whole interesting subsequent uh, epilogue to the story, which, of course, you know, his memorabilia is worth a huge amount. And he always tried to evade, I think very successfully evaded paying the damages. I don't know how he hid his money. And he then got caught... Um, carrying out an armed robbery on someone who was selling his memorabilia in a Las Vegas hotel, and that's how he got jailed, because he was trying to control all the stuff that was worth anything. Yeah, that's very yeah. interesting. Do you have any other questions for yourself? No. Anyone else? Sorry. <laughs>
but you're much better than Jeremy Paxson, if I may say so, at this interview. It's interviewing me. Can I quote you on that on my website? Yes. Hi there. Do you find uh, being on radio, uh, is there more freedom on radio than there is on TV? Yes, as a woman, over 40, radio is brilliant. Um, it's not that I don't do any telly, but with radio it's just the idea and you don't get given grief about anything to do with your physical appearance and I've had my share of that and I'm, you know won't have it again. Um, and the thing is, I'm now free enough, I just pitch ideas. So I'm just finishing a documentary about Arnold Bennett, the writer who was one of the most successful novelists in the world uh, in the early 20th century at The Old Wives' Tale. Felt completely out of favour and has been virtually forgotten, even though I know a few people champion him. And I see it as a kind of sequel to I Dress as a Geek Stardust, because it's about a self-made boy, um, in his case from Stoke, well, what's now Stoke on Trent. And you know, he was he was writing films that we you know Alfred Hitchcock was talking to him. He was um, actually wrote a porn novel that they're trying to find, which has been lost. But I've read one of his erotic poems, it's really bad actually. But he wrote amazing books. He wrote Piccadilly, which is one of the big silent films. Um, of great silent films of the 1920s. So I just love finding stories like that and, you know, going off and making documentaries about them. So, um, and I'm hoping things, there might be something about Westerns coming up, which is my other big love. I love Westerns. Westerns. We Chris Froning, you know. He's been oh, well, I interviewed him in my um, archive hour. Uh, He's a big world authority on the spaghetti Western. Yeah. But I don't like spaghetti Westerns as much. I like uh, the old ones with Barbara Stanwyck. And, oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> great. Any more questions? Is, is oh, there a reason for that? Um, no, um, we did film that. This was the Islam on Veil documentary. It was just, I had to fit travel plans around other things. And by the time the visas came through for Nigeria, I couldn't go. This was a country which was hosting the Miss World competition at the time, but had also sentenced a woman to death for adultery. And um, in, oh, I'm trying to think which state it was. Um, I think it was Sakoto, which is in a particular province in the north, which again has essentially an Islamic government. They're very quick to kind of find very vulnerable village women who, you know, they, who are single and pregnant, and they get done for adultery, and the men are never troubled because... Um, and often in the end, the, se the sentences are nearly always commuted, but it's just that harassment of women to prove some kind of point, which is so depressing. And the crew went and filmed, I mean, it's real rural Nigeria, it was an amazing place. So I'm sorry I didn't go. But it was good. Those are the kind of stories where people are trying to apply Sharia law and it's always on the most vulnerable. Mm. I've got one. What's your, what would your dream job be that you haven't done yet? Well... Apart from having your dream job. I would have liked to be main anchor of Channel 4 News. That wasn't going to happen. Um, I... How's it a bit about that. Isn't I can't. Oh, I, I can't. I honestly can't tell you. Um, but I did some great work there and I'm pleased with it, you know. Um, and, I mean, you know, I would like to, I'd like to be news anchoring a main programme. I'd like to do this today programme or something like that. Oh, you'd be great at it, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll vote Samira on the today programme, <laughs> don't you? We'll have you. But in, the, but in the meantime, I try and get editors on Newswatch. I don't know if any of you watch it. Yep. But, you know, they won't come on. It's supposed to be it's set up after the Hutton Inquiry to make news accountable to its viewers. And some viewers, some viewers send in stupid complaints. Like, I don't, I don't want to know the weather except in my house. Um, you know, and we really get emails like that or in my garden. Um, but we do get really good ones, like why are reporters calling them militants or insurgents when they've just carried out a terrorist attack on a gas installation in Algeria? You know, and are you being politically correct and why? And... I'm still trying to get the editor of Newsnight on, which is one of the reasons I went on Newsnight a couple of weeks ago, was to say on air, I'm still trying to get your editor on, will he come on? Yeah. Um, and they don't like coming on, because we challenge them, now our viewers challenge them. Yeah. So that's, maybe that's why they won't give me a job presenting my own show otherwise. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, don't give up. Um, Channel 4, has it changed at all? David Abraham, I interviewed him. The, the I don't know. I mean, to, I don't work there anymore, and I kind of, it's sort of it's part of my past. Like I love talking past. about my work there, and I have colleagues I greatly respect, but, you know, I'm a freelance. Uh, that's the other thing. It's really important. I'm a freelance. I don't belong to the BBC. I feel I am an outsider, and I think that's quite an important... You know, I've embraced that as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. I'd love to have the security of a staff job and a salary. I don't. I have to constantly pitch new ideas and get new series on. But, you know, I do really, I work really hard. And, you know, I mean, we had Tommy Robinson on Sunday Morning Live, which is this ethics discussion program I do in the summer on BBC One. And, you know, we had enough time to really challenge him when he'd had this big conversion to joining the Quilliam Foundation. And I just think, you know, I do my job. I still get to do great journalism. Mm -hmm. It's just that I have to find different places to do it. Mm -hmm. You know. Any more questions for Samir? Um.
I do get approached by people sometimes. I get emails out of the blue about things. Um, but sometimes it's just having an idea about something that's current. And then you find people to talk. So I present a show on Radio 3 occasionally. It's now called Free Thinking. It used to be called Night Waves. It's rebranded. And it runs at 10 o'clock um, Tuesdays to Thursdays. And I'm doing one next week. And you know there's a new musical version being made of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And I said, why don't we have a discussion about the cultural history of the scoundrel? Because it's an 18th century creation. And there's a huge post-war rise in them where there were all these films of Terry Thomas and all the Ealing comedies. They're all kind of about challenging class and they're all about getting one over the establishment. And so that sort of pegged to something that's happening. But I just, I mean, I think that's what you do. When you've been in journalism long enough, you just start to look uh, for fresh angles because... Um, a lot of the stories are the same, a lot of the themes are the same. And similarly, when I've done criminal trials, you take it on its own merits, you're reporting it fairly, but often you think this, this is similar to something that's happened before, or it's genuinely new and groundbreaking. Um, and I always think, you know, the great thing about journalism is you can take things any way, um, and you're always reassessing things in the light of what's gone before and where you are today. And that's one of the great things about this job is as you get older, it's actually useful because you have more knowledge. You can remember when Margaret Thatcher was in power mm. and you can look for the parallels and the contradictions in the new kind of coalition government. Mm. Yeah, well, phone hacking is interesting. I mean, uh, there's a limit to what I can say just because there's a current trial going on. So obviously everyone's innocent or proven guilty. But if there are convictions... Um, I think it will be, one, it'll just be a huge deal. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen the papers, all the stuff that's emerged about Tony Blair having phone chats and offering advice to Rebecca Brooks and, and Rupert Murdoch. I mean, this is amazing stuff. Crucially, I think Ian Hislop has said it famously before, everything that happened in phone hacking was already illegal. Um, it's just interesting how long it had been going on and actually, relatively speaking, how openly, and there's this big dispute about whether Piers Morgan ever said he'd heard a phone hacked conversation of, from Heather Mills's phone. Um, I think in a way we need to wait and see what the convictions are, but um, I'm one of those people, if you ask my honest opinion, I'm still more wary of government regulation, despite the fact that I'm appalled by everything that's been uncovered by Hackgate. I'm more concerned about the potential for government regulation to stifle things like exposing the MPs' expenses scandals and all that's emerging about what are all the MPs' personal interests in private healthcare companies getting into the NHS. You know, anything they could do to close that down, privacy laws. I mean, I think... You know, this is a, I often have conversations with French journalists about, oh, you English, your obsession with, you know, MP sex lives. But I just think, what does it tell you if a president is spending, you know, state money and is deceiving the people closest to him? And in the case of Mitterrand, he was hiding his own ill health. He set up a spying unit. And what was exposed eventually, because of exposing his adultery, was actually the man had been carrying out illegal um, surveillance on journalists and political rivals. And people got criminal sentences as a result. So all that is at risk, I think, if we have too much regulation. But I mean, I don't know, I'm just a journalist, so maybe I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There've always been lots of women. I mean, I actually, 90, I think it was 90, 1990, I joined the BBC. There've actually always been lots of women. Um, I just think you look at who's, it's, it's something about the way power operates that's really interesting. There are many women editing programs. So the editor of PM on Radio 4 is a woman. Um, Jenny Abramsky was the head of radio um, back in 1990. You know, there are always these individuals who are, who are very senior. There's something about the culture that still seems to affect things. And I certainly think it's interesting that all the new appointments at the BBC, nearly all of them have been male to big senior editorial jobs, and often from very, very upper middle class kind of Oxbridge private school backgrounds. And that isn't changing. You know, it's still not changing. And you could argue with what I said earlier about the cost of university and entry to journalism. It's going to get worse before it gets better. OK, I've got one last question, and that is any advice for budding journalists in the room? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the main thing is you really want to need to show that you love it and you do it. And um, I've met people who say, oh, I'd like to be a journalist, but they've never done shown any interest in even, you know, writing for the school magazine or student journalism. And they don't write and they don't watch news or anything. I think they just want to be on TV or something. And I just think, I think if you want to be a journalist, you love writing, you love... I love talking to people and finding out stories and watching and reading news critically. I mean, 
the, the, we could have a whole separate conversation about what the internet has done to news because I think it's harder to get good paid work. But also I think blogging has slightly diluted journalism. So anyone can set up a blog. You know, anyone can sort of be a kind of journalist. But actually getting good at it and writing for a, a, a good quality brand is harder. And I think there's a bigger gulf now between the superstar writers who are paid loads of someone, say, the national newspapers and how little people are expected to write for. I mean, you know, take, for example, most national... most. I mean, I know for a fact the Daily Telegraph does not pay a load of its bloggers, and they have, you know, byline blogs on the Daily Telegraph website, and they're not flipping paid. I mean, that's the biggest problem we've got. Um, so I don't know quite how we challenge it, but the BBC in a lot of places is still doing proper paid work. It, but it, it's, it's always going to be competitive, and I just think you have to really want it and work hard at it, and someone's got to get those jobs. Mm. The number of times at the BBC I get emails saying, oh, you know, we're setting up a panel discussion on the glass ceiling. Would you like to be on it? And you just think, I'm tired of having conversations about it. I just want to work and I'd like to get on and be judged on my ability. And I think the biggest issue you've got is there's a lot of talk about it as if women are some kind of problem they need to be helped or minorities are a problem they need to be helped. And if you genuinely recruited on talent... I do not think you'd have a problem. And I have talked about this in the past. When you, you just look at people appoint in their own image, and especially at senior level, you appoint people who kind of you feel comfortable with. I'm still amazed at the number of senior journalists I meet who know no black people. In London, I mean, how is that possible? And they don't seem to feel that that's a lack that they could maybe compensate for in other ways. People don't know basics about Islam, not because they need to, you know, care about Islam or believe in it, but it's a news story. And I've a number of times I've often said, I'll run a class for you. I'll give you a basic, you know, um, A to Z on what you need to know about five major world religions because we should know this stuff. So a lot of that depends on a narrow elite of people, and I hate to say it, but you know they tend to be you know upper middle class white straight men who run things, and they think their worldview is neutral. It's not neutral. It's one worldview, and they're the ones who are making decisions about too many things in our lives. And I'm not saying that's a slag off anyone who's white male and upper class in the room and straight, but it's when people feel that that point of view is, is is a mainstream one, and therefore a female point of view or a point of view from someone who might be of a different ethnic background or a different sexuality. That's a minority view, and we can have that in a special section. Give it International Women's Day. We'll run that story. Um, that's my challenge to news: is if you genuinely you know, think openly and you want to represent everyone and you're acknowledging your own limitations, you wouldn't have a problem with the glass ceiling because you'd be appointing more women and more people from other backgrounds because you wouldn't think, oh, well, they're a minority. You've already got one Asian woman doing that. Why would we want another? I've heard those conversations. What a fabulous guest, everyone. Sorry, I got really angry at the end there. <laughs>